on behalf of everyone in the family of St. Andrew's Church, I'm delighted to welcome you to St. Andrew's Media. Whether you're joining us right now as we go live into worship, or whether you're catching up later in the week, I want you to know you are welcome. You're very much part of our community. So join us, be part of us as we journey together in faith. My simple prayer is this, that when we get to the end of today, when you click off after this service, you'll be saying to yourself, I'm glad I was part of St. Andrew's Church this morning. Welcome, and thank you for joining us.
And welcome to you all this morning for joining us for worship. And we especially welcome any visitors who are with us this morning and everyone who is joining us online. I have now referred to the bulletin. The Quest magazine is now available for the collectors to pick up and deliver as promptly as possible. Thank you. Lunan Court service this afternoon at 3 p.m. Anyone wishing to go to help there should meet outside Lunan Court at 2.55. The evening service at 6.30 this evening is in the sanctuary and the speaker will be Andrew Bennett. The Guild meets tomorrow night and there is a change to the syllabus and the subject is love to sit but still keep fit. That sounds good. <laughs> The special prayer evenings continue on Tuesday and Thursday and they will meet at 7pm in either the small halls or the session room. The, De the Dementia Drop-In Cafe meets again this week on, at 2pm in the main hall. Thank you. The men's retreat is coming up on 9th to 11th of March, so if you would speak to Jim McLeod on that one. And Amy Louise is looking for anyone who's willing to help with the Holiday Club, which will run from the 2nd to the 6th of April this year. So anyone interested should see Amy Louise. The Persecuted Church Group will meet this week at, on Thursday on the 15th of February at 10... Well, that's not this week then. That's another week away. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, but they will meet on Thursday the 15th of February. And the welcome badge amnesty is still running, so anyone with badges, please return as soon as possible. And the quiz sheet fundraisers that Andrew and Fraser Fair are doing, which ran out last week through uh, exceptional applications, so these are still available at one pound, so you're invited to trust your brains with that. Thank you. Now, Adele has something to say. <laughs> Morning. Uh, last week I mentioned Bible Alive, which is a program that Gavin and I will be starting in a school, local school, in a few weeks' time. I am looking for somebody to make us some drawstring bags for the creation story. Probably about A3 size, if that's, if that's a good estimate. Linda and I are wondering if there is somebody out there who might be able to maybe alter pillowcases. I'm looking for seven drawstring bags and each one with a number on the front from one to seven. Um, and they'll contain things like little toys for when God made the animals, a torch for God making light and, and dark, things like that. So if you can help, please come and see me. I would love, I could buy these. There are drawstring bags I could buy, but it'd be really lovely um, if you could be involved in some way. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. And now I just have to welcome Gavin Berry again to uh, join us this morning and we look forward to his preaching to us. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I'll just repeat what I've just said. That's not a problem. Well, I, I did say good morning and welcome. I can hear myself now, which is uh, always a good sign. Uh, but uh, I was just assuring you of uh, our prayers, best wishes from Olden Abbey Church, uh, where I am parish assistant, you may well know. Uh, we pray in particular uh, for your minister, your kirk session, and anybody else we feel needs prayer. Uh, so I, I hope that that is a, is a comfort to you. Uh, we're here to worship God. Uh, and that, of course, is our main reason for meeting this morning. And uh, before we come to that, 
I did have my own call to worship uh, organized, but I'm going to use the prayer that's been uh, provided on the order of service sheet. Can I also just say at this point in time that you'll see me drinking quite regularly from a glass or any other kind of vessel this morning because I'm suffering from that, that well-known and very underestimated by the female gender uh, illness of man flu. Uh, so m many of the men are sitting there nodding in, uh, in agreement and understanding, and I appreciate that. Uh, so if you do see me drinking and perhaps coughing from time to time, then that's, the, that's my excuse, and I've given it in advance. However, let's begin our worship, uh, and perhaps you'd like to join with me as we say this short prayer together that's printed on the order of service sheet based on the readings from uh, Philippians 2, verse 8. Lord, we come before you not seeking our own glory, but to looking wholly unto you. Give us grace through our life in every thought and deed to imitate your meekness and humility. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a much better call to worship than the one I had prepared, I hasten to add. Well, let's clear our throats, metaphorically speaking for some, and uh, let's sing to God's praise hymn 110, Glory be to God the Father. Thank you. Please be seated. Let's continue our worship of God as we turn to Him now in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank You for this special day that You have told us to set aside for rest and worship. Thank You that because of what the Lord Jesus has done on Calvary's cross, that we can enter your holy presence this morning, for you no longer see us as sinful. We thank you, Father, that we can meet in the comfort of this building and read from the Bible without fear of persecution or imprisonment. We pray for Christian brothers and sisters around the world this morning for whom that is not the case. Be with them, we pray, and strengthen their faith in you to provide and protect them. We thank you for each other, Lord, and for friendships which span the years. Forgive us when we take each other for granted, 
and when we gossip behind each other's back. Enable us to be more like Jesus and to love one another as we ought by encouraging each other with kind words and deeds. Help us also to take our relationship with you more seriously by reading your word more often and by setting aside time to meet with you in prayer. We thank you for our young people here this morning, from the youngest to the eldest, and pray that you will bless them during their time here with the grown-ups and later at Sunday school. Remind them, Heavenly Father, that you are the God who is with them every minute of the day, and not just at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. We ask that our young people might grow in their knowledge and love of you, and that their Christian faith would help them as they make their way through an increasingly confusing and complicated world. We also commend their parents to you this morning for their faithfulness in bringing them to church in an age when there are so many other appealing distractions laying claim to their time. And finally, Father, if we're feeling weary this morning and far from you, then we ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to draw close to us and embrace our souls with a heavenly hug as we confess our sins to you this morning and obtain forgiveness one more time from your deep reservoir of heavenly mercy. God of all grace, inspire us and enable us to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our prayers as we say together the words of the Lord's Prayer as it's printed on the order of service. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, boys and girls, young and old, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to what Adele has to say to us this morning. Apparently, it's got something to do with hands. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, boys and girls, I need you to come down the front to help me with something, please. Are there any boys and girls here? Do you want to come and see what I've got? Oh, soon, I promise, soon, yeah. Okay. Oh, I've got lots of boys and girls today. Find a seat. So boys and girls, can you all do this for me? Show me your hands. Great. We've all got wiggly fingers. Yep. Great. So, I've got some things here. What do we use our hands with these to do? Oh, Jamie, your hands up first. What do we do with them, though? Yeah, we eat lots of yummy things, don't we, with a fork and knife. What about this? Yeah. Yeah, we're drawing, writing with our pens and papers, maybe pencils, maybe doing some things at school. What about this? How do we, what do we use our hands for with this one? Can somebody show me? Can you show me what you do with this one? Spread your <laughs> yeah, toast. you do. But how do we get the butter out? With a knife. Okay, but before we get to the knife, do you want to show me? You yep, use your hands to open it so we can get the butter so we can spread it on our toast. Fabulous. Now, the last one I've got here, what do we use this with our hands for? Washing, yeah. We use it to wash our faces, don't we? It's a face cloth. Well, we do lots of things with our hands, but we also tell people things with our hands, don't we? So Ewan's going to come just now, and he's going to tell you things with his hands, and you've got to try and guess what he's saying. Well, you can stand up if you want to show the, the, uh, the grown-ups. Can everyone see me? I'm no, you're too little. You'll have to stand up. 
So what's your first thing you'd like to tell us with your hands? What's he telling you? Just shout out. Yep, thumbs up. What does that mean? Yeah. Yep, he's good. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, what about the next one? What's he saying? Hi. Hi, yeah, he's saying hello, nice to see you. Maybe you're far away from somebody, you can't speak to them, but you can wave. The next one's lots harder. Lots harder. Oh, yeah. Stop where you are. Yeah, you can. So we can do things with our hands, but we can also say things with our hands. There are also things that are maybe the grown-ups use. Maybe you use them sometimes, and I've got a few pictures. See if you can tell me what the names of these things are. Oh, they're up already. Oh, wow, what a big word. Yeah, that's a stethoscope. And somebody else tell me what we use it for. Yeah, Yeah. you put it in their ears, and then they use their hands to hear your heart. The next one is? Oh, we know that one, don't we? You just put up nails in the wall, put up pictures, make things. What's the next one? <gasps> yeah, make pictures or paint the wall, that kind of thing. And the last one? <gasps> What's that? Yeah, what do we use our hands for to do? Yeah, chop, 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 chop. Well, that's all very good things that we do with our hands. But do we ever use our hands to do things that are not so nice? Yeah. Can anybody give me any examples of things we do with our hands that are not nice? What do we do that are not nice? Yeah. Okay, when you go, Jamie. Yeah, sometimes maybe smack smack people. Yeah. Maybe punching people, yeah. What about, do we ever drop things and break them? Yeah, I do that sometimes. By accident, but still not very good. Well, Jesus was really helpful with his hands. He was always doing things to look after people. It says in the Bible, 200 times, it mentions Jesus using his hands or touching people or using his fingers for things. And it was always for good things that Jesus used his hands. And he wasn't afraid to do things other people maybe wouldn't do. Maybe give people a cuddle or maybe put his hands on them and pray for them. He was never frightened to use his hands to either do work or to help people um, who are maybe not well. And we can learn that too. We can do nice things for people. Who can do a high five? Give the person next to you a high five. Yeah, that's a nice thing to use your hands for, isn't it? Or maybe we can pick our toys up. But even just that little high five is a really nice thing to do. Say hi, somebody, give them a big high five. Sorry, I forgot you were there, sweetheart. So can we remember that this week, to do nice things with our hands? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to say a prayer for us just now, okay? Lord, thank you that we can use our hands to help others, to look after ourselves, and to pray for people. Help us to remember to use our hands nicely this week, not for hitting or breaking things. Sorry for the times that we hurt people, or we do things that are not very nice with our hands. But help us to remember Jesus' example of being careful and kind to others and help us to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, boys and girls, before you go back to your places, I've got a song that requires actions, which means you used to use your hands. Can you use your hands with me? Yeah, well, we're going to get a song. There's going to be guitars playing, but not those ones. (laughs) Okay, so this song we did last week. Who was here last week? Were you here last week? So the actions... Adults, you can join in the song and the actions if you really want. So stand up for me. We'll do the actions again to remind you. The song's called... You can help me, Ewan. Uh, the actions are like this. We've got to say, no, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. So pretend, make your little, little, little person in your hand. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Okay? And then we say, set an example... For the believers, for the believers, for the believers, okay? And then the next bit, there's lots of fast words that I always forget when they're not on the screen, but we do one, two, three, four, five. Okay, do that bit again. One, two, three, four, five.
think you can do that with the song now? Do you manage? Yeah? The song's going to be on the screen for us. great message and what a great song. Well, as the young folks head off to Sunday Club and Crash, uh, Audrey, uh, I believe, is going to come and read uh, from the Bible for us. But until then, why don't we take an example from the young people this morning and use our hands uh, for something positive. And just with the person sitting next to you, or perhaps in front or behind you, just wish them God's peace as we Extend the hand of fellowship to each other. <laughs> God's peace be with you. God's peace. God's peace. So today we're reading from the New International Version, and we're reading from Philippians 2, and we're looking at verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature a God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, 
by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above everything, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We give thanks for this scripture. Amen. Thank you, Audrey. Well, the band is going to lead us uh, in our praise song, hymn 481, Jesus is the name we honour. Thank you. That was great. That was great. As parish assistant at Alden Abbey Church, a large part of my work quite rightly involves visiting the sick, the elderly and the lonely. This is mostly in people's homes, 
but also in hospital as well. Recently, on one such pastoral visit to Arbroath Infirmary, I stopped to read a small poster on the notice board outside the female ward. You perhaps know where I'm talking about. My eye, you see, had been drawn to to it by a picture of a very smiley-faced African-American woman who very much resembled Oprah Winfrey. Well, certainly from where I was standing without my glasses. As you can imagine, I am a huge Oprah fan, and I'm always keen to hear whatever latest perils of wisdom her media team have come up with to endear her even more to the American people, if that's possible, in her not-so-secretive ambition, I suspect, to become the next President of the United States of America. I have to say, much to my disappointment, to begin with, it wasn't Oprah. Instead, it was a lady called Maya Angelou. Some of you may have heard of her. She was, she's now deceased, she died in 2014, I believe, an American poet, actress, and an important figure in the American civil rights movement. And in 2001, she was apparently named as one of the 30 most powerful women in America by that well-known organization I'm sure you've all heard of, the Ladies' Home Journal, whoever they are. Now, at the risk of overdoing my introduction to our Bible study this morning, it was this simple but relevant quote by Mrs. Angelou that I wanted to share with you for our edification as followers of Jesus this morning. For she said this, she said, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said, they won't remember what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. Some of you may know that quote already. I'll say it again for those of you that didn't, didn't know it. At the end of the day, people won't remember you uh, for what you said or what you did. They will remember how you made them feel. Well, as a self-taught Christian theologian, you'll forgive me, I hope, if I say that the intention behind Maya Angelou's words sound very similar to the intention behind those of the Apostle Paul that we read earlier, which, which were, of course, addressed to the Christian church in Philippi some 2,000 years ago, but they're also relevant to us this morning, aren't they, as part of the wider and continuing church of Jesus Christ here in our growth. You'll probably know that proper Bible scholars say that Paul wrote his letter to the Philippine church during a two-year period of house arrest in Rome round about the year 61 AD. And if you know that, then you probably also know that he wrote to them not only to thank them for supporting him financially and otherwise during his time of imprisonment, but also with a variety of purposes in mind. The good news is, though, that I only want to focus on one of those purposes this morning. And that comes as no surprise to you, I'm sure, is to imitate the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to do that in our day-to-day dealings with each other as Christians, but also because the Bible is of timeless relevance to us, we're challenged, I think, also to make a conscious effort to behave in a selfless and Christ-like manner in the 21st century society that we find ourselves living in. I don't know about you, but if uh, reality TV programs like Celebrity Big Brother are anything to go by, then the society that we live in is kind of characterized, I seem to be echoing and getting louder. Is that an issue? (laughs) Is it okay? Yep, okay. Uh, it seems to be characterized by being really quite self obsessed, hedonistic, and increasingly seems a bit old fashioned and out of place to use the word, but I'm going to use it anyway pagan. Not all that different, in fact, to the society 
that Paul was speaking about in ancient Philippi. Excuse me a second, I did say I would be drinking quite a lot. Well, from my limited experience, striving for personal humility in life is is not a quality that our society values very much. Especially if you want to succeed, for example, in the world of work. But in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2 of our passage this morning, Paul not only says that humility is an important behavior to work on as a Christian, but he actually stresses that it is one of the hallmarks of a successful Christian life, which sounds a bit of a contradiction in terms, really, doesn't it? Because as Christians, we recognize that we're failures. That's why we're here this morning. If you're here for any other reason than that, then I think maybe you're in the wrong place. But I think you do know what I mean. In other words, that we're trying to make the most of the Christian life that God has given us. Listen again to what Paul says. He says in verse 3, starting in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In a world which measures success, I suggest in very contrasting ways to those of God, Paul's desire for us, as it was for these early Christian Philippians, to imitate or indeed copy Christ's humility is what I think the football pundits would say is a real big ask. Don't you think? I mean, doesn't Paul know that our world actually says things like, you've got to put number one first to succeed, or you've got to be ruthless in business to get ahead? Anything less than these worldly attitudes would surely be considered weakness, wouldn't it? Well, strangely enough, during a brief three-year adventure, some 15 years ago into the business world of educational sales and marketing, I came across a good number of businessmen and women who said they were Christians. Some of these folks, unfortunately, bought into a very worldly way of doing business, which, with all the pressures and temptations that prevail in that kind of environment, is maybe understandable. But I also came across a number of very committed Christian men and women who stuck to their principles of integrity and humility, even in business, and even when the temptation to compromise in favor of making a big sale or winning a valuable contract was very great. I also remember these people as being very open much to my surprise about their faith. And on occasion, I even joined them, would you believe, for a prayer meeting before the day's business began at whatever educational exhibition or conference we happened to be attending that particular day. I also remember that they were seldom, if ever, judgmental towards the non-Christian business people they mixed with. Instead, they seemed genuinely interested in the personal uh, as well as the business lives of others. It's maybe not so surprising then that despite the usual teasing that abounded about being a, and you'll be familiar with this, a Bible basher, they were well respected by their non-Christian peers and competitors alike. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Friends, when we pin our colors to the mast and confess our allegiance to Jesus Christ, the world watches on like a hawk. 
to see if we will walk the walk or just talk the talk. If Christ's personal humility and integrity of character were the qualities that attracted so many people to come to him whilst he was on earth, then why should it be any different, I suggest, for those of us who purport to walk the way of the Master? Do you remember the words of Isaiah who said, and I'm paraphrasing here, there was nothing stunning about his looks that attracted people to him. Instead, there was something else. Can I suggest that that something else was winsome humility? Winsome humility. It's a very underrated but very powerful force in the Christian's armory. Incidentally, if you were wondering and perhaps worried about those humble Christian business folks going out of business, I can assure you that they didn't. Uh, they were pretty successful in their chosen line of business, which in a sense should of course serve to remind you and me that God, as the Bible tells us, is no man's debtor. I think it must be a bit of a spiritual law that when we honor God in our lives, whether it's at work or in our personal lives, then he always honors and blesses us. Our obedience to God will probably not win us that contract or promotion at work that we'd like to have, but it might do. You just never know. But be in no doubt this morning, friends, that our God is never slow to reward our obedience towards him. Even at times when it looks as if we've lost out in worldly terms, the reality for the Christian is that God has a much more meaningful way in mind to bless us. I'm sure that many of you folks sitting here today can testify to an experience of God at work or in your personal life just like that. Well, the next and penultimate part of my shorter than last time sermon, <laughs> I knew I went on too long, so I apologize by making this one slightly shorter. I've entitled it Motivation to Humility, which is based on what we read earlier this morning in verses 6 to 11 of chapter 2 of Paul's letter. These verses have often been described as one of the earliest Christological hymns ever written. And if you're not sure about that word Christological, then neither was I. But what it does mean, and it really is quite, uh, quite straightforward, is that it's the theology, the theological truth concerning the person and work of Jesus. Well, these words are certainly worth reading again before I say anything else. So let me read them to you, and if you, you want to follow them in your Good News Bible, that's fine. Uh, but I'll be quoting from the New International Version. And I'm reading in from verse 5, uh, if you'd like to follow with me. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, 
but at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The question's really quite simple, I think, and it goes a bit like this. Why should we listen to Paul about pursuing Christ-like humility? What does he say that might motivate you and me this morning to strive for more or better personal humility in our lives? And if, like me, you already know that you struggle with humility, and you're probably tempted to ask the question like this, what's in it for me, Paul? And of course, that way of asking the question is lacking any trace of humility and serves merely to convict us, those of us who need it most, a lesson from Paul on imitating Christ's humility. If you need further convincing about Paul's right to preach at you and me about humility this morning, then can I remind you that it was Paul who as chief Pharisee, Hebrew of Hebrews, and chief persecutor of Christians, had all the trappings of worldly success. Before that is, he encountered the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, you'll remember. To say that Paul was changed by his encounter with the risen Christ is an understatement, of course, because Paul was totally humbled and transformed by what we refer to as the gospel. The gospel, of course, is just the good news that God himself has already come in the person of Jesus Christ, revealing his plan of salvation for sinful men and women like you and me. The key part of God's plan has already been accomplished, in fact, by his son's sacrificial death on the cross which he willingly undertook in the place of every sinner, male and female, ever born. But as again, I'm using a football analogy here, and I hope you'll forgive me. The gospel is a game. You can see it coming, can't you? Pardon the pun. It's a game of two halves. What I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, it's not enough for us just to hear about God's plan of salvation and react in a passive manner to it and maybe shrug our shoulders as we might react, for example, to the news, good or otherwise, that Burger King is to be soon opening a new outlet in our growth. They're not, by the way, so don't get your hopes up. Well, Burger King is going to do that anyway, if that was the case. Uh, And it really would just depend on whether they want to or not, and if it gets permission from the local authority. The point is that, in the scheme of things, that doesn't really matter. And it doesn't really matter how you or I would respond to that kind of news. It's hardly life-changing anyway though some Burger King fans here might argue otherwise, I suspect. But all joking aside, it's not the same when it comes to the good news of Jesus. But friends, if you know the gospel, if you hear and you know the gospel, then I suggest to you that you can't remain indifferent to it, for it is truly life-changing. If you accept it as true, and sitting here we do, and you want to be part of God's salvation plan, then you need to do as the Apostle Paul did on the road to Damascus. And that is, you need to actively accept God's offer by humbling yourself before Him. And that involves putting your pride aside. And we all suffer from that. Because we need to acknowledge 
that we are the created beings. We are not the creator. We need to acknowledge that we are sinful. We do things that offend God. And we're in desperate need, not just of a saviour, but the saviour. The saviour that God has in his wisdom and in his mercy provided for you and me in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. The only one who can bring us back to our loving creator God. The one that maybe you've been rejecting for some time. Or maybe the one that you've been misunderstanding all this time. You see, friends, and in particular I'm speaking to those of you this morning who know that you have yet to accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Once armed with this knowledge, Paul not only humbled himself before God as he accepted God's salvation plan, but he also said that everything he'd known prior to this in his life, the prestige as the chief Pharisee, the status that went with that, the wealth, all of the stuff that surrounded that, that he now considered that garbage. In fact, I think the original Greek is even more offensive than that. But he considered it for our sensitive ears as garbage compared to, well, compared to what? Lots of money? A different lifestyle? No. Compared to knowing Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord. Paul had discovered, I believe, that commodity which is so difficult to obtain in a world that rejects God. It's a priceless commodity that he mentions 16 times in his letter to the Philippians. For he wants to make sure that they, and you and I, get it. Have you any idea what that commodity is? It's not school. You don't need to put your hand up. You can shout it out. Well, if you're not sure, that commodity is joy. I wonder how many of us sitting here this morning could honestly put up our hand and say that we were joyful. Yeah, we know what it is to have joy. I'm not talking about being happy because that's a fleeting, emotional thing that's of no relevance to us today. I'm talking about true, deep-seated, irrevocable, indestructible, Christ-given joy, which unlike happiness, that the world offers is eternal, not dependent on our emotions, not dependent on our circumstances, not even dependent on whether we're feeling happy or not. And it's certainly not material in substance. True Christian joy, I hope you see, which is worth more than all the world's riches combined, comes from knowing and understanding who this Jesus Christ is and what he has already done for us because of his great love for us. You see, once you've understood that, stu understood that then like Paul and all the other apostles gathered here today, then there is no one and no thing I believe that you would rather admire more, love more, and desire to imitate more than Jesus Christ. For he is humble and unique among all the gods, isn't he? For he, unlike all these other gods, left his heavenly home to come and pursue us with his love. That's what he's done. That's what he continues to do. It may well be that he's pursuing you today. 
well. Allow yourself to be caught. You won't regret it. As we go out into a new week to love and to serve the Lord, then we would do well to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, who also said that if we want to be great in his kingdom, then we have to humble ourselves and make ourselves the servant or slave of all. We can all breathe easy, folks, and praise God this morning that he doesn't expect the likes of you and me to do all that under our own steam. I can certainly breathe a sigh of relief at that. Because his word says that we have already been given every spiritual tool to equip us. And much more than that beside. Because he's deposited the enabler, hasn't he? His very own Holy Spirit into the heart of every Christian believer here today. You don't believe that? You're not sure about that? You don't feel that that's true? Well, put your emotions to one side and remember that it's the Word of God that is telling you that. You have God's Spirit in you if you are a believer to comfort you, to rebuke you on occasion, and to enable you to live the Christian life. How amazing is that? I don't know of any other God that promises that. Finally, in our dealings with other people this week, may we also remember the wise words of Maya Angelou. Do you remember those words? She said at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did, but they will remember how you made them feel. Folks, wouldn't it also be something if people that we're dealing with, speaking to Christians and non-Christians alike in the week ahead, if they also knew what it was and were able to give thanks to him who inspires you and I to show God's love to them. Friends, I don't know about you, but I would find it very difficult to love other people were it not for the knowledge that God loves me. For I know the depths of depravity and darkness in my own heart. And despite that, the friend of sinners everywhere who is the Lord Jesus Christ loves me and you. The servant king full of meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, that's whom we serve, the humble God who is Christ. We're going to sing to his praises now as we think about all of that and uh, the band will lead us in our praise. <coughs>
Thank you. We continue to worship God with our offering this morning. In a moment, uh, Andrew, uh, your vocational volunteer, uh, is going to come and lead us in our prayers for others. Uh, but for the moment, let me just uh, say a short prayer of dedication of the offering on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of health, wealth, and fellowship that you shower upon us daily and we're grateful for. We give you back some of these financial gifts as a small token of our gratitude to you and our worship of you this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we come before your throne of grace this morning with our concerns for other people at home and abroad. We come trusting in your ability and desire to act according to your good and perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the worldwide Christian church praising your name in a thousand different languages. We pray especially for the churches in regions where any religious faith is suppressed 
or where Christianity is seen as an unwelcome minority. Give courage and faith to all who hold the name of Jesus central to their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we commend the church in Scotland to you, of which we are part, and pray that up and down today, your offer of forgiveness and a fresh start for those caught up in a life of sin will be communicated with love and not in judgment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our minister, Martin, and his family, that they might know your continuing presence with them after so many difficult personal events in recent months. We pray that you might restore him to full health and remind both him and Elaine of the plans you still have for them, to bless them and not to harm them. Lord, mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we remember the needs of people in our own community and church family, the elderly, the housebound and lonely, as well as those in care homes and hospitals and let us now share a moment of silence as together we bring before you people and situations weighing heavily on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And merciful Father, please accept these our prayers, for we ask them in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Let's conclude our worship this morning as we sing together to God's praise hymn number 502, Take My Life, Lord, Let It Be. And now, may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. <laughs>